How's it going, everyone? Wayne the Known here, and welcome back to another episode of Geek and Out. We basically discuss everything nerd and, nerd and geek related. I'm joined here by another by another special guest, Brad. How do you so how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Caro or you got it right the first time? <laughs> I'm here with Brad Caro, who, if you're not familiar with, is a composer and editor for such iconic shows like Knight Rider, Batman the Animated Series, Ben 10. Two Angry Beavers, Rocco's Modern Life, SpongeBob SquarePants, and many more shows you may remember from your childhood. Again, Brad, thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, no, you're very welcome. Um, So uh, to begin, how long have you been doing this stuff for? The editing and like, you know, being part of like the music, music department for TV shows? Well, I got into the industry in my about i guess i must have been about 23 i got into in 1984 i got hired by dic entertainment which was doing cartoons such as inspector gadget and and uh garfield uh and so i got hired initially uh, i was an apprentice sound effects editor so um i did that until we all got laid off right before christmas which was lovely and then uh, uh Never, never, that, never a fun time getting laid off around Christmas. No, but you know, that's the nature of the industry. You know, you work on a show until the show's end and then uh, you get laid off and you hope to get called back for the next season. But after that, I, I actually went into live action and that's why I went to Universal Studios and was working on, we, there were a ton of shows going on at that time. And I was assistant music editor and I was working on shows like, um, uh, as you mentioned, Knight Rider, Magnum P.I., Miami Vice, uh, Murder, She Wrote, uh, what a, Simon and Simon. Oh, wow. Yeah, those, those are like definitely those are like shows from definitely like from like the early 80s and on. That's right. I was there 85 and 86. And then um, the TV season ended, of course, got laid off. And uh, uh, I did a few little things. And then I took a break from the film industry. Uh, from 88 to 90, I decided to go back to college. So I went to school during the day and I drove a taxi in LA at night. And I did that for two years. Uh, when I got my degree, I decided to get back into the industry. And so I uh, had interviewed over at Warner Brothers Animation and uh, they hired me. So I have a funny story. The last day as a cab driver, I get a call, pick up a guy standing on the corner of Ventura and Sepulveda Boulevard. He's going to Hollywood. Like, All right. So he gets in the cab and I tell him as we're driving, hey, today's my last day as a cab driver. He says, really? What are you going to be doing? Oh, hang on. Sorry, my phone <laughs> rang. You're fine. Are we on? Because I'm not seeing the... Oh, yeah, I think because you have your... I think because you there uh, we go oh there we go okay continue the story uh, sorry about that oh you're fine yeah so um so anyway i uh i get it get the guy in the car and we are driving to somewhere in hollywood and i said hey today's my last day as a cab driver and he says really what are you going to be doing i said well i got hired by warner brothers animation and i'm going to be doing track reading now track reading is where this is before computers okay so everything was everything was uh um on film the audio was on was recorded first of course in animation you record the dialogue first and it's put onto 35 millimeter film that has a magnetic stripe on it okay so my job as a track reader was to have this thousand foot reel of you know a, a you know a, of a dialogue and crank through it manually, very slowly listening and writing down the phonetic sounds of the voices. So like very slowly. So it's like, hey, low. And I'm writing all this down frame by frame. And that's what they use, the directors use, to make the lip assignments to make the characters' lips move in sync with the dialogue. That's pretty okay. cool. I've like always wondered how how'd that work how they were able to get the 
voice the voices to match with the mouth movements i mean i can, right. i know that's not always easy to do no but uh so it's track read first it's recorded and then track read and then someone takes the work i did and puts lip assignments to every sound that i that i showed and so when it's animated uh the mouths are in those positions and it looks like they're saying those words oh, wow. so i said yeah i'll be track reading for warner brothers animation he said wow he said well that's really interesting because i'm starting a new cartoon series and i don't have anyone to do that would you like to do it freelance on the side and i said well maybe he said well what would you charge i said well i got to look into that so he writes all his information down on a piece of paper and i drop him off at his location and that was john chris relusi the creator of ren and stimpy what? and i ended up working for john on the side and i track read every single episode oh, of ren and stimpy. i can't imagine that was that wasn't easy no but you know what was harder than doing ren and stimpy was hmm. doing beavis and butthead oh or you worked on, you worked you worked on about the- yeah, about a third of them. About a third of them. And oh, wow. and try to track read. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, all, you all, know. Those, all those like the noises they make. I can't imagine that was that wasn't easy, especially with how fast they talk too, and like all the like yeah. the <laughs> noises they make. Well, with Warner Brothers, yeah, and with Warner Brothers trying to track read the Tasmanian Devil's voice was oh, because you worked on the Tasmanian Devil show back in the nineties called Taz. That's right, oh, man. That's right. So back at Warner's, I was doing Tiny Toons and Animaniacs and Tasmania and uh, and it, what was the other one? Uh, there were a few others, uh, the Tweety and Sylvester show. And anyway, so I was there for five years doing that. And then um, somehow, because I wasn't sending my resume around, but somehow Nickelodeon got a hold of my resume. And I got a call saying, hey, we're looking for a, uh, a film editor for Rocco's Modern Life. Uh, the, the existing film editor was leaving. Now, up till then, I had not been a full film editor. I had just been an assistant editor, an assistant music editor, assistant sound effects editor. So I said, well, I'll come in and interview. And I drove there on my lunch hour from Warner Brothers. And the whole time I'm psyching myself up, like I'm the best editor in the world. They're, you know, <laughs> telling myself this, even though I'd never done it, you know, uh, as a full editor. And I got there and I interviewed and I was driving back to Warner Brothers after that. And they called me on my way back and told me I got the job, which I thought was incredible because I saw later on, I saw the stack of resumes that they were going through. And there were a lot of people had a lot more experience. Oh, I mean, I you but wanted to work lucky. for like, uh, wanted to work for a Nick or Warner Brothers at the time. I mean, I can't imagine, like you said, big stacks of, of, of resumes. Well, people who already had been film editors. Yeah. So, so I got the job uh, and I started working on that, uh, 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 Rocco's Modern Life. And when that show ended, they put me on Angry Beavers. And during the time I was on Angry Beavers, once in a while, I would edit an occasional episode of Hey Arnold or Cat Dog. Um, and um, and it was during that time that SpongeBob came along, the pilot to SpongeBob. Now, Steve Hillenberg was one of my directors on Rocco's Modern Life. So we already knew each other and he knew a little bit about me. So I was chosen to, to edit the uh, pilot to SpongeBob. Well, uh, uh, so, you know, I assembled the show and Steve Hillenberg and I were sitting in my editing room and uh, we're cutting it. And uh, at one point he turns to me and he goes, you play clarinet, don't you? And I said, yeah. He said, well, we got a character on the show that plays clarinet. Would you like to be Squidward's clarinet on SpongeBob? And I said, all right, whatever. And here we are 24 years later, and I'm still the guy that plays a clarinet for Squidward on, on SpongeBob. So to this day, you still do the clarinet for Squidward? That's right. Cool. You know, I, I have a little studio at home. The music editor sends me the video. I record in my studio, and I send him the video. I send him the audio, and if he likes it, great. If he doesn't, I redo it. And now he's got this huge library of my clarinet playing, so he... <laughs> He picks stuff that I, I don't even have to record. He picks stuff that I've given him that he reuses. So, but when I was working on the pilot, Steve said, 
he, now he didn't know I could compose music. You know, I, I don't know how he assumed that, but he said, uh, hey, would you want to uh, try to write a main title theme, this action theme we have in mind for the, you know, for the pilot of SpongeBob? And I said, yeah, of course. And he kind of gave me an idea of what he wanted. And it kind of made me think of this old TV series from the 1960s called The Mod Squad. I've heard of I've heard of that. Yeah. And it had this really kind of it was rock, but it was with a big band. It was rock, but it was trumpets, trombone, saxophones and tambourine. And, you know, it was it was 60s rock. So I wrote this piece. And back then, sequencers weren't very good. And I, he wanted to hear what it would sound like. So I sequenced it and he heard it and he goes, I don't get it. It just sounds, it sounds like an accordion because the sounds were bad. You know, the notes were there, but it didn't sound good because it was all this synthetic sound. So I said, all right, well, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and record it with all the real horns, trumpet, trombone, saxophone, drums, uh, keyboard, bass, uh, and all the percussion stuff. I'll go ahead in the studio and I'll record it all. So I went ahead and did that. And then I, uh, after it was all done and mixed, he came to the studio and he sat in the chair there and we played it for him. And he sat there for a second. And he said, uh, play it one more time. And so we played it one more time. And he turned around with a smile on his face and he said, yep, that's it. And so that became the, uh, the main title action theme to the SpongeBob pilot. Now, I didn't know this. I didn't hear this firsthand. I heard this from... Uh, the head mixer at Nickelodeon was that Steve actually wanted that to be the main title for the and, series. Uh, and I heard that too. I heard that, but, they, that like, it sounds yeah. awesome. It sounds, I would have loved to see that for the pilot. <laughs> well, yeah, except the, the network has a final say. Yeah, and yeah, they said, we want something that has lyrics and tells a backstory. And so they took the sea shanty called blow the man down, which is hundreds of years old. And they just, added new lyrics to it and that was used as the main title but you know i mean it is what it is it, uh, uh after that they did hire me to do more writing and i i wrote uh, the i co-wrote the fun song with uh sherm cohen and i wrote uh the underwater music song the underwater uh techno song uh jellyfish jam oh god um, you you wrote that. that you wrote that i wrote that and oh, i put wow. in all the sound effects and all that they didn't they animated that song they i first i made the song and then they animated to the song so they just said we want to have all these sound effects of things you would see under the sea so i had tambourine and they made that chains and i had uh, uh a lap guitar which they turned into uh I don't know what what was that was it the the legs of a jellyfish getting strung I don't oh. remember <laughs> Right and then I I took the sound of a porpoise cuz remember I had worked in sound effects so I was good at editing sound and I put in the porpoise of the dolphin sounds and all that. And then they edited, they created the cartoon, uh, that sequence of the cartoon based on, on that song. And then, uh, I wrote, uh, I wrote all kinds of music, calliope music for the, uh, glove world. Uh, whenever they go to glove world and you hear all the Marigrand music, I wrote a bunch of that stuff. And, and, uh, um, so anyway, so, I got to write a bunch of music for the show, which I'm grateful uh, that I had the opportunity to do. And then after that, I landed another series that didn't get seen in the United States. As a matter of fact, I don't know where it aired, but it was called Puccini's Yard. And it starred Billy West, um, the voice of Ren and Stimpy. Oh, wow. And it's about a dog who is owned by a rich woman in a mansion. And the woman dies 
and the dog gets sent to the pound and gets adopted by this ugly American family. And so he's an elitist dog in this, you know, family of like uh, lower, uh, not highly educated, ugly Americans. So um, I wrote the main title for that series, uh, the end credits and a bunch of underscore. We did 26 half hours. And um, and this was and this is it right here. That's it. Yeah, that's it. I have, I feel like I've heard of this. Away, he wound up in the pound where he was soon found. Now he's got a new family. They're not rich, but they're happy. He's a eyebrow who's living with no lies. Puccini. <laughs> yeah. So the main title I I wrote. And and, uh, was a classical piece with a full orchestra. And then the underscore I wrote, I kind of went along the lines of Carl Stalling, like the original uh, Looney Tunes uh, uh, composer uh, with a full orchestra and all that kind of stuff. And they had several other composers on the show. I didn't do all the episodes, but I was the only one that used real horns. Uh, the music sounded better, but as a result, I broke even on every single episode because I was paying studio time and paying the trumpet players and the <laughs> trombone players and the wind uh, woodwinds and all that kind of stuff. But so, so yeah, um, but Billy West did do a pilot for a very interesting thing. Uh, it was a puppet show that was behind a green screen. So the puppet was like, it was a puppet, like, but in real life with green screen backgrounds. And it was very politically incorrect. And the character of this pipe, the main character was named Billy Bastard. <laughs> and the character was based on Buddy Rich, the drummer, who was known to go on these tyrants, you know, it just, but the Billy Bastard character was a drug addict and he was a racist. And uh, but we did a pilot and uh, nothing ever happened after that. But uh, but it, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, but no, I don't think anyone else has ever seen it because I don't think it got put online or, or anything. I've never heard of it. So how did you get into doing music? Like what made you decide music was something you wanted to do back then? Well, I started playing clarinet at 12. And then in high school, I picked up the saxophone. And since I've been, since I graduated high school, I've been playing in bands all around LA. I mean, I led a big band when I was 18 years old and uh, uh, and then uh, did that for a few years. Uh, I've been a working, you know, I don't make my living as a musician, but I work in bands and get, you know, uh, professional bands uh, and play. I, I actually got to play with the band corn one night um they were they were performing so i for one night i was a rock star they were performing at the ventura theater oh if you have a picture of that i would love to share it if you have a picture i, of I don't but i have it in my mind uh oh but, man but the fact that you got to play with such an iconic band like corn that, that must have been pretty cool it was pretty crazy i mean it was standing room only and everyone was singing along with all the lyrics and everything it was nothing that i had ever been to before because i i've always been a jazz uh player that's been my main uh, uh style of music that i play is jazz nice so you did you did it for spongebob you did it for buccini did you do any uh any other music for any tv uh, any other tv shows i think I okay, so no, I, I I did a couple of pilots that didn't go anywhere. I I wrote the main title for a Disney pilot that was called uh, Big Shorts Mouse, and it it was uh, for Disney TV, and the main character was Andy Richter, who did the voice of Big Shorts Mouse, and Big Shorts Mouse was this rat. He wasn't a mouse. He was a rat. And he had, he had, you remember how Felix, the the cartoon Felix the Cat? Oh, Felix the Cat. Yeah, I'm familiar with Felix the Cat. If, if so no he one's had familiar a mag- with him. Yeah. So he had a magic bag and he could pull things out of the bag, right? Anything you would imagine in the cartoon. 
So in this cartoon, Big Short's mouse could pull things out of his pants, that whatever was needed at the time. So I wrote a main title for that, and it never went past the pilot. I guess the Disney company didn't feel good about having a, a rat pull Not things cool. out of its pants. Oh, we're talking about, uh, you You can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, I think this is, I think this is, I think this is a different one, but this is, this one, I don't, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It says Big Schwartz Mouse, but I don't think that's the one you were talking about. You know, I never saw any animation. I just wrote a song. Now that says, that's about the year that I wrote that. Yeah, it so says 2003. Maybe, so maybe... They made a movie that I'm unaware of, and now they were going to make a TV series based on it, but the TV series didn't go anywhere. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. It, it seems like, and I've noticed that a lot, especially back in the day, a lot of cartoons had, like, pilots, and that that's it. They were just a pilot. Mm -hmm. um, when I was at Nickelodeon, I edited a ton of pilots that didn't go anywhere. There was yeah. one called... God, there was one called Dog Boy. And they had me cut that so many different ways to try and get the network to buy it. And they just would not buy it. And that was a character, was a dog. But he was like mistaken for like just a kid. And so he was showing up at school, but he was a dog. But yeah, they, they never... They turned that into a different show called Teacher's Pet. I remember I said, I remember hearing a, 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 Nick, a Disney show called Teacher's Pet where it was a dog pretended to be a boy. Okay. Well, maybe that came before this or or if it was after because uh, this was Nickelodeon. Oh, well, and, well that... uh, yeah. So back to back to Sound Department. What was it like doing working on sh uh, sh the show Night Rider? Well, you know, I mean the things that stand out to me about working on working at Universal during that period of time is that I was working on the lot. This was 1985. And a lot of the old great actors were still around, you know. And so I have one memory of, you know, I was an assistant. So, you know, a lot of times I was just carrying reels of film from the studio, from the soundstage to the or from the uh from the editor's office to the mixing room, you know, um, I was doing a lot of menial work, but one time I had a big stack of reels, 35 millimeter reels that I couldn't even see past. And I ran right into Ernest Borgnine and he was so nice about it. He was just so nice about it. Uh, and I had a run in with, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Anthony Perkins. The guy oh. who played the original Psycho. Right? Really? So I was walking to my office and he was there because he was directing either Psycho 2 or Psycho 3. I'm not sure, but it, it bombed horribly. <laughs> but um, I was on a part of the lot where there was no one around and he came walking out by himself and I saw him and I recognized him and I said, Hi. And he looked at me like I was a slab of meat. And he said, hello. Like that. <laughs> and I got so creeped out. I froze. And then I just kept walking. And I just walked back to my office. It kind of freaked me out. Um, I did spend some time working at, at Warner Brothers Television. Uh, probably around 1986. As assistant music editor on a few shows they were doing. I think one of them was Scarecrow and Mrs. King. Um, and that I had very interesting day when I, I got to, I saw an old man standing on, in the lot on a hot summer day. There's this old, tall, skinny man wearing a black suit and he was lost and he was really old. And I went up to him and I recognized him. It was Jimmy Stewart. And I said, uh, can I help you? And he was looking for a soundstage and he couldn't find it. So I escorted him to a sound stage, and I don't know what he was shooting, but uh, uh, I got to meet Jimmy Stewart. Kind of, kind of cool during the very last part of his life. Crazy. You know, my father was in the film industry, and yeah, my father was a sound effects man for thirty years. So this this kind of run, in the way and, this kind of runs in the family. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, he, uh, you know, he won three Emmys and, and uh, he uh, was part of a team that won two Academy Awards. Uh, one of them was on, uh, the only time I worked with my dad was on the first Back to the Future movie. Well, you worked on Back to the Future? For the last month of post-production, I was the apprentice sound effects editor. Which that's, meant I just, that's... that just means I carried reels <laughs> from the editors over to the sound stage. And it won the Academy Award for Best Sound Effects. And I tell everyone it's because of the way that I carried those reels <laughs> that it won the sound effects. But um, he also worked on, uh, and they won an Academy Award for Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, but his Emmys were on uh, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, one was on a Jacques Cousteau documentary. Uh, one was on a TV movie called The Night That Panicked America, which was a, a movie about, a TV movie about the Orson Welles broadcast about uh, the War of the Worlds. And then he won a an emmy for an episode of roots uh because they he worked on uh he worked oh, on that. so that... my dad if you look my dad up larry caro his i am his imdb is huge you know i mean just so so much stuff uh but uh yeah he worked he kept very busy but when things went digital he retired uh he did not want to learn computers he was used to working hunched over a oh he worked iron. on they, he worked on they live yeah that's a good movie oh, running man rock wow i mean i don't i don't i don't blame you if your dad's been doing it for so long when everything got switched to digital i mean i mean imagine for you like you were working since the 80s i imagine it was definitely a different change of scenery when things went to digital uh when you started but I had the advantage that when I was at Nickelodeon, after being there for two years, they bought all the equipment to go digital and they trained me on it. Oh, that's good. Um, so, you know, and they chose the right system. You know, when things went digital, there were a bunch of different companies vying for to be the one that everyone used. And it was a company called Avid that I, won. I've heard, of, I've heard of Avid. Yeah. And now uh, Avid owns Pro Tools, which was... The industry standard for sound and music editing, uh, even before vi video went digital. Um, so yeah, I, uh, they trained me on the Avid, and it, you know, uh, and that's what I switched over. I guess it was on Angry Beavers that I started working digitally. Oh wow! I mean, yeah, that's like that's like the mid '90s right there. I imagine. It, I imagine when it came to like the the early '90s. And like the mid to late nineties, I imagine it was definitely a, a big change of scenery of like how things were changing. Absolutely. I mean, I remember the, the changeover when it went from 35 millimeter magnetic film to digital tape. And then eventually no more tape, just, you know, oh, wow. uh, but uh, I worked for this one company uh, called Lada productions and they were a music editing house and they were using the 35 in, uh, millimeter magnetic tape and then when they switched over to the digital tape i mean the editors were having were using razor blades and cutting tape and putting it together and stuff like that you know so how you do it you know how you do a fade out when you're you, with a 35 millimeter magnetic tape there's a magnetic stripe on it on one side and if you want to do a fade you have to you take a razor blade and you scrape off some of the oh that's how they magnetic yeah I mean like with the editing software I use Movavi you can just like if you don't want to cut apart you just you know click the hit the cut part of the on that one section click it and remove it and if you want to fade there's like the option to do that but I think doing it the old way like you're saying I mean a buddy were talking about that how like they used to you know if they wanted to cut a scene out, they would take a razor blade or take a, a pair of scissors and cut it out and then put it back together. Yeah. I mean, we had, I had, I still have all that equipment. I, I, uh, I have a moviola, I have an editing bench, I have a sink block and all that stuff. And you have a, a block that's got a thing that comes down and cuts the film and there's pegs that hold the sprockets in place and you have a roll of tape there and you do, you know, yeah. Yeah. I think another good example of like how they like would use like especially like the film for an example like uh 
Batman the Animated Series back in the 90s, if you're like watching one of the older episodes, you can see like the letters and numbers on the screen of the of the film they were using. Oh, yeah. 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 I miss the smell of of film. You walk into an <laughs> editing room and you smell the emulsion. It's a certain smell, you know. But uh, it's interesting. When I was working at Warner at uh, Universal, I was working with music editors that had been music editors on like the original like Alfred Hitchcock presents and and oh wow I mean guys who were like at towards the end of their career and had been doing it their entire lives so I had the you know it's it's really cool to watch like some old black and white show and there's hey Maury McNaughton you know some guy that was an old man when I knew him that had done all this you know these old stuff so it sounds like you were also you were you were like were trained by these guys who've been doing it for like since like the 50s or 60s yeah yeah now did you ever like when you were younger did you ever think like this is something you'd be doing when you're older it wasn't until well i see my that's what my dad did and so at some point i decided hey you know what i'd like to do this and so my dad, you know, little nepotism, he got me a job as a driver for an animation company. So all I did was drive. And I did that for a month and and they got to know me and they liked me. And then that's when they got me into the union and made me an apprentice editor. And 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 aside from that, and uh, the one month I worked with my dad on Back to the Future, I really was responsible for my own. My dad was with this one company, like his whole career. And... Um, so I was kind of like on my own as far as finding my jobs and such after the first one. Uh, and, you know, there were times where times were hard and there wasn't work available, you know. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. It just, it seems like you've definitely done a lot over the years. Um, a question I've asked on another series of mine, what kind of like impact has this had on your life? It's really funny because I really never thought about Squidward's clarinet having any sort of impact on anybody other than me having a good time and getting to be funny. Because when I record it, I'm not recording to be bad. I'm recording it to be funny bad, you know. And so I plan out in advance when I'm going to squeak and when I'm going to play the wrong note or whatever. But I didn't know that so many people cared about that. And when I went on the uh, the uh, SpongeBob fan group on on uh, Facebook, and I posted that, yeah, I got a secret. I'm I'm the guy that plays clarinet for Squidward. Within 24 hours, I had like 5,000 uh, likes and like a thousand comments, and people were saying things like, "I started playing clarinet because of you," and I started, <laughs> I became a music teacher because of you, and thank you for you know, uh, improving the quality of my child. I mean, it, it was, in, I was almost embarrassed because it was like, geez, you know, wow. You know, uh, I had no clue that, well, first of all, you know, when I worked on the pilot, I knew it would be a big series just from the pilot. As a matter I mean, of fact, when I was cutting the pilot and Steve was sitting behind me and I'm sitting at my computer cutting it, at one point I turned around to him and I said, this is going to be big. I mean, and it's then, it, it's been going on for yeah. 24 years, plus with movies, the spinoffs. Yeah. Well, about a couple of years after that, after the pilot, I saw him at a party and I said, you remember when I turned to you and I said, this is going to be big? He said, yeah, he <laughs> remembered. And I actually have a, a letter of uh, uh, recommendation from him for my work as a composer and as a film editor uh, that means a lot to me. Now, especially now that he's gone, uh, I had this lovely letter that he put together for me to help me find for, uh, further work. That's really nice. I mean, it sounds like you and him like, had a good partnership of working together for all those years until his passing. I mean, that's yeah, I was crazy. Very sad. That was very sad. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got to know him and his wife and, uh, uh, yeah a really really sweet man oh, you know wow. i can see i can see him in spongebob oh yeah no i i i i don't doubt it at all and the fact that you wrote that that pilot theme for like in the like the late night what is it 97 98 
98. I wrote it in 98 and the, and the TV hit the show, hit the screens, I think on 99. That's yeah. insane. Um, now for those who may, um, uh, want to get into this, like, like whether it's, you know, for music or sound editing, what's like some of the hardest, where are some of the challenges when it comes to doing what you do? Well, you know, the industry has changed quite a bit. And, oh, and, that's an, that know, is an understatement. Right. The thing is, is now that everything's done on computer, anyone with a computer that wants to spend $300 on the sound editing software uh, and go on, uh, you know, uh, you know, there are sites where you can be trained in using it. But it doesn't mean everyone's good at it, but anyone can get the equipment needed to do this it used to be when my father was working there would be like 12 sound effects editors working on one show it's like you take this reel and you take this reel and and that's how it was done but now you only need one guy to do all that work so what that means is there's not as much work available and it's extremely competitive and it's almost impossible to get into the union unless oh, yeah, you get no. in what we call a Taft Heart lead. So you have to get hired by a union company that brings you in. But it's that's a hard thing to have happen. Oh, I'll so it's that. yeah. So I mean, there is non-union work out there. Um, I know that uh, you know there's like the uh, the there's the uh, the Film Institute, uh, American Film Institute AFI. Uh, there are, you know, and there are colleges, full-on colleges that offer programs, but you could go and spend a fortune in getting a degree and there's no guarantee you're going to get any work. I mean, it, you're like, you're like, you're basically like metaf metaphorically speaking, you're like fighting to get work to work for these well-known companies, like whether it's Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Warner Brothers, Universal's like whatever. That's right. It's, it's, it's a really... It's a really hard industry. I, you know, I got out of the industry, uh, the editing portion of it back in uh, 2013. So for 10 years, I've been not working in editing at all uh, because in, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2013? Yes. Because I would, at the time, I was working from home, working for Cartoon Network on shows like Ben 10 and and uh, a bunch of shows. I, I don't even remember. Oh, yeah. Uh, Billy and Mandy. I, I, saw, I saw that, like you did that, Evil Con Carne and all that. Yeah, yeah. And so I was doing track reading. I had the equipment at home, so I was doing that from home. And in 2009, I, I decided, you know what? I want to switch careers. So in 2009, I went back to college while I worked full time. And I got, I finished my bachelor's and then got a master's in clinical psychology in 2013. And now I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And I work, I'm a psychotherapist and I've been doing that for the past 10 years. Oh, wow. And uh, 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 the only thing I do in the film industry is the occasional writing of a song for a show and playing Squidward's clarinet. And aside from that, I, I play in bands around town and, and, uh, uh, you know, that's my playing music is, is a way for me to, uh, do self-care. Yeah, I, I feel like self-care is like the best kind of care. Absolutely. I mean, you have like over 40 years, uh, yeah, 40 years roughly of like film experience from editing the sound editing to music. It's like, you've definitely, plus you've seen the change of when they switched to digital, digital too. Yeah, I was. I saw it as it happened. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, some people stuck with it and some people fell out. And, uh, you know, my dad went from winning three Emmys and two Oscars to cutting up chickens at Costco. <laughs> that's what he, you know, I mean, he didn't want to work in the industry anymore. He didn't want to do it that way. And so he, he retired. He had a nice pension. And, and uh, just to keep busy, he went to Costco and cut up chickens. He, they didn't hire him. He just would go there and cut up chicken. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he just, he just liked to cut up chickens. You know. <laughs> no, I I'm mean, I, I feel like at everyone's point in life, when they're like, they don't want to do it anymore, they'll try to find something that's not as like 
tiring or, or exhausting, they'll find something that is easy on the like not just on the body but the mind as well. And yeah. I can tell when, still yeah. play music and doing the marriage counseling thing, I can tell that that helps. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh yeah. You got I, I gotta be busy. I gotta be doing stuff. Yeah. So outside of all the work you've done out of film and animation. What's it been like doing what you do now with like the playing with the bands and the marriage counseling and all that stuff? So, so I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, but the majority of the work I do as a therapist is with individuals. And I've had the good fortune since I started this career 10 years ago to have, well, I spent a year living on the Island of Borneo, uh, uh, working at a, uh, a substance abuse treatment facility uh, treating people from all over the world, excuse me, that would come there. Um, I, uh, I worked at the fancy rehabs in Malibu for all the rich and famous people to get sober. Oh, wow. Um, I just came back five days ago. I just got back from two and a half years living on a small island in Alaska called Sitka. And I worked in community mental health there for two and a half years. Uh, and, uh, and now here I am back in Southern California and I, as Monday, I start working again, uh, for a company based in California. Uh, uh, I'll be seeing clients. I love this, this work, uh, as a product of doing this kind of work. Uh, I feel like I've grown as a human being. I feel that I, I've, uh, learned a lot about myself as well. And I've learned a lot about the human condition in general. Um, it, it, I, I'm so grateful that I did all that work of going to college and 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 and. Uh, You've literally worked your ass off to get to where you are. Yeah, because in California is the hardest state to get. <laughs> it's just you know? it's. I imagine I mean, from someone who used to live in California, it's not easy to try to get anywhere in life uh, down there. It's hard, but I got to tell you. I was living on an island in Alaska where the cost of living was more than Los Angeles because all the food has to get put on, brought in on a Oh, barge. yeah, by, by plane or by... Yeah, by, uh, by boat, not by, by plane. Oh, by boat, so, oh, wow. And that takes so longer. It takes longer, and so it's hard to get fresh produce, um, and the produce is very expensive. Um, oh, all the groceries are experiment, expensive. Electricity is expensive. Housing is everything there was more expensive than LA. Oh, geez. And that's saying and was, something. <laughs> it is. And I was living in a town of 8,000 people um, and on an island, and there's nowhere to go, you know. Uh, and so uh, everyone knew everyone's business. And uh, usually how it is with small towns. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, so it was a great experience as well. And, but I'm glad to be back here in Southern California, because now I can get back into playing in the bands that I used to play in. And I'm close to my family and my friends because I really miss my support system being isolated in, in Alaska. Oh yeah. No, I, I imagine it's nice to be back there and doing what you can, not only to, you know, provide for your family, but you know, provide for the community as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one last thing I always ask, um, any last minute advice you want to give out there to those who are listening or watching in general about what we've talked about in this past, almost past hour? Well, if you are interested in the, getting in the film industry or getting into the animation industry, um, you know, you will be looked at a lot more seriously if you have some sort of training. Now, there's two ways of getting that training. If you're an artist, usually that involves school, okay? If we're talking about, uh, get, you know, this goes, this is kind of like, runs parallel to something that I asked Anthony Bourdain, because I went to a lecture of Anthony Bourdain's and I got to ask him a question and I said, my son wants to be a chef. Should he go to chef school or should he start at the bottom as a dishwasher? And this is what he told me. And this applies to the film industry. He said, you could get all that training in, in, in you could go to chef school and get all that training. 
But when you start working, you're going to be washing dishes. Okay. So having some of the knowledge is important, but you're going to start out at the bottom and you have to be okay with that. You, it, you have to be passionate enough about doing this because you have to do this. You know, the, the, the professional musicians I know who are professional musicians, which is a hard way to make a living. Okay. They do it because they have to do it because it's in their soul. It's what they need to do. They're driven to do that. If you're not, if you don't have the passion to do the, uh, the kind of work that we're talking about, then there's plenty of other people that'll, that'll go and be a driver for a company for a long time until they can move up to the next level because they have that passion, you know? Um, so any kind of field where it's really extremely competitive, I would say it's probably the same thing. You have to be passionate about it and, uh, as well as have the appropriate talent for whatever it is oh, you're yeah. looking at it, you know? Yeah. Oh, I, I hardly, hardly grin. Just like you said, just know that if it, whoever wants to get into this type of industry, whatever industry, just know you're going to have to start at the bottom and really work your way up to the top. Cause there are some people who were who get lucky enough to where they can start at the top and then there are people who have started at the bottom, but they slowly work their way up. Like, just like you did, you started it's, at the bottom and you just worked your way up. Yeah. Everyone I know started at the bottom. I don't know anybody that got in and immediately was, you know, it took me 11 years of being an apprentice and an assistant editor and, until I became a full editor. So that's 11 years of carrying reels around and, and doing assistant work for other editors. And, and, and that's just the natural uh trajectory so yeah be passionate oh i i wholeheartedly agree for those who are watching definitely words to words to live by and something to take into consideration i think that should do it um real right. qu a real quick brad where could people find you on social media if they want to stay like up to date find out like the stuff you've done give you a follow stuff like that okay so i'm on facebook of course uh you can find me for my name. Look me up uh, my name. Just look for the Ren and Stimpy profile picture. Yeah, I got that uh, <laughs> That wearing the happy helmet. I do. Let me look this up for you. I do have a TikTok that people might want to get on because it's. I have two TikToks, but this is the one where I actually put material up. And it's, uh, hang on one second. Yeah, I'm going on, I'm going oh, on TikTok right now so I can follow myself. Yeah. So the TikTok account that uh, that you want to look at is called the dot mediocre dot clarinetist. Okay, the media dot the media the media dot okay the mediocre mediocre dot, dot clarinet. Clarinet. All right, and I just followed. Nice, cool. So I've got a couple of videos of me recording clarinet for Squidward. I've got my composer demo reel up there. Uh, I've got something I did on, and I've got something. When I was 15 years old, uh, I put a Dixieland band together. And we performed on a NBC game show called The Gong Show, which I've was heard, popular. I've, in I've, heard of, I've heard of The Gong Show. If you have video, if there's a way. The video's on my, it's on my TikTok. You can with, see your, with, your, with your permission, could I share that on here to show people? Yeah, I'm fine. You got, I'm playing okay. clarinet and we did an old tune called Jada. Well, I think that should do it. Again, Brad, thank you for coming on. And as always, I am Wayne the Unknown. Until next time, thank you for listening. And as always, thank you for watching.